Thank you, Bernadita. So I'm going to continue on. Um, you know, I think you all know, all, everyone attending kind of notices the theme of the connection between crop load and rootstock and nutrition. I'm going to kind of reemphasize some of that in the first couple of slides and then get into some nutrient uh, management practices um, and kind of uh, maybe spur some discussion. Uh, so just a few, a few more slides. Um, so this is work done with Victor, Victor Blanco, my postdoc, and Terrence Robinson really led this effort to bring together a lot of the NC140 trials and do nutrient analysis on both the Honeycrisp and Fuji nutrient or uh, rootstock trials um, all across the United States and very different environments to tease apart some of these, these key rootstock differences and how they affect nutrition and how they affect uh, bitter pit development in Honeycrisp. And we did this for using data from, or using samples from 2018, 2019, and 2020 across 26 different, different rootstocks. Um, so these are these are the the ten different locations that were sampled. Um, so ranging British Columbia and Idaho out west, Kentucky, Maine, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Utah, and Virginia. Uh, thank you to all those collaborators for for sending the peel samples that we use for nutrient analysis here, as well as um, providing yield data and storing fruit and assessing bitter pit um, after three months of storage. So these are all NC140 plantings. These are the locations, um, like I said, very, very different growing environments, differences in precipitation, differences in, in max and min during April to September. And really one of the, the common themes across the whole, whole three years is, is the, the crop load relationship really came through, but you still see a lot of variability that there's you know, some situations where crop load can be low, and bitter pit can be low, and situations where crop load can be high, but bitter pit can be a little a little higher as well. So it's not a perfect relationship, but it's key that crop load is one of the key drivers in bitter pit incidence across all these different sites. Uh, so I think we analyzed over 3,000 samples representing 3,000 different trees across these 10 locations. So one of the things that we see is the, uh, this biennial effect. We talked about uh, crop load and how that contributes, and then Honeycrisp being highly biennial. Um, these are planted in either 2010 or 2014. So 2018 would be a on year, 2019 an off year. So odd years are off, even years are on for both of these plantings. And we see that clearly on the top where crop load was higher both in 2018 and 2020. When we look at bitter pit, bitter pit on average, there's a whole lot of variability because it's a really large data set across, across a lot of rootstocks and a lot of different environments, but bitter pit was higher on average in that, that off year. So crop load is playing a key factor. And then you look at calcium concentration in the peel, in the fruit peel, and you see calcium concentrations are lower. So you see this clear relationship between crop load and nutrients and bienniality. So why, why crop load is such a critical part of Honeycrisp nutrient management. What, what's even more clear than, than crop load is, is this potassium to calcium ratio. So this integrates the effects of rootstock, the effects of growing environment, the effects of soil, and the effects of crop load on all of this. And it's real clear this strong linear relationship between potassium to calcium ratio or nitrogen to calcium ratio in the, the peel and bitter pit percent very clear across all these different locations. So this is an average for each, each rootstock at each site. You see that, that clear linear relationship. So it's, it, from here we see that for both Fuji and Honeycrisp, so Honeycrisp was on the left where bitter pit percentages were much higher. Um, we see a relationship with crop load on this bottom, and then we see a relationship with potassium to calcium ratio. And we see the same relationship with Fuji, just with lower in bitter pit incidence and, and higher crop load on average and lower potassium to calcium ratios. Just, just Fuji is, 
is just uh, that much better at taking up calcium than, than Honeycrisp. But what we see when we look at the rootstocks is when we separate out what we consider tolerant rootstocks versus vulnerable, and there's a more detailed analysis we have here, but this is basically the summary of, of what we found, is that for both Honeycrisp and Fuji, the rootstocks that we would consider more tolerant of uh, have less bitter pips, so B9, 4003, 969, um, supporter 3, um, G2, G214 for Honeycrisp. They're, those are, are have lower bitter pit incidence and then vulnerable G41, V6, um, G11. So Leiling mentioned G11 as, as being vulnerable. We see that across all these different locations. And, the, and the, I guess the, the most encouraging news here is that the, that rootstock effect is actually consistent across all these different environments. So we can make that same recommendation for good rootstocks across all these different environments, which is, which is a, a really key finding because then we're not trying to match up a specific rootstock with a very specific environment to, to avoid bitter pit. It's, it's consistently, consistently reliable across all these different locations. So to get a little bit into foliar sprays, the big question I get from water growers is, 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 is about foliar sprays and, and you know, what to use, how much to use, when to apply it, um, there's, there's a lot of questions surrounding that, you know, what products to use. There's, there's so many different products on the market. Um, we've done some work using tracers to look at the uptake of calcium fruit sprays. Um, on, so it depends on fruit surface contact for absorption of calcium into the fruit. And, and really what we see is that when we apply all across the season, we get a, a uptake of calcium across the fruit surface and absorbed into the cortex, um, whether it's applied early in the season or later in the season. Um, but when we start to do the math on really what's the, what's the efficiency of that uptake, um, we see that about 10% of the spray hits the fruit surface in a high density orchard, kind of doing the math on, on total volume and what, what actually contacts the fruit and makes contact with the fruit surface. And then only 10% of that ends up in the cortex. So 10% of 10% is 1%. So you have maybe one to 2% efficacy of calcium chloride getting into the fruit cortex where it has its effect on bitter pit and where it increases calcium in the cell, in the cell walls and intracellular space. And so when, if you apply it, at 15 pounds of active calcium per acre. So that's if you're applying 50 pounds of calcium chloride across the season, you can really only increase calcium in the fruit by maybe 10%, 10%. And when calcium concentrations are already so low in Honeycrisp, and if you're in an off year where crop load is low, or you're in a, a regraft spot where vigor is high, and you need, constant, you need calcium concentrations to be 200 to 300% higher to, to reduce bitter pit risk, increasing it by 10% is not going to be the solution. It's gonna be a tool to help you, but it's not going to be something to rely upon. And then the, the figure on the right is, is something a little bit um, uh, new. Again, using the same tracers, we looked at different temperatures of application. Um, so there's questions about when to apply. Um, so we see that actually uptake, when temperatures are low, so lower than 77, the, the absorption of calcium chloride is higher. So it's purely just a function of longer wetting of the surface. So the longer wetting, the longer the absorption, the quicker it dries, the less absorption you have. So not only is it, is it dangerous to apply calcium, uh, specifically calcium chloride when it's hot, for getting uh, foliar burn and, the, and possibly fruit marking, but also avoiding that um, yeah, spraying at times where the wetting stays longer increases your efficiency. So lastly, I'll just kind of end to get to the questions on this that, you know, there's, there's really uh, outside of rootstock and, and crop load, you know, there's ways that we can increase calcium in the fruit, but it's, 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 it's relatively minor to those two other two key factors. Um, when you, so foliar sprays are a tool you need to do. Um, looking at 
active calcium is, and Terrence mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, I know Bernadette has mentioned this, active calcium is one of the key factors looking at, at foliar, if you're going to be doing foliar sprays, um, applying them, um, applying them at low temperatures to increase wetting time, applying them in high frequencies across the season, um, starting as early as possible. And also just to, because you want to focus on that balance between nitrogen, magnesium, and potassium to calcium, be really careful with those, those foliar applications of those other nutrients because these are antagonists and they can create problems in fruit quality going into harvest. Um, one of the key things that um, is important to consider is that transition between establishment and production. So Honeycrisp being low vigor, we're, uh, you, know, you generally have this tendency to really push the growth. You want to fill that canopy space as much as possible. And it's a struggle for, for Honeycrisp. And you, know, you might be applying uh, a lot of nitrogen. You might be watering a lot and loading up those trees with nitrogen. And then, and then you need to account for those nutrient reserves and vigor as you enter into production. So it can create a lot of problems in those first two to three years of production. And that's really where the long-term profitability is, is um, going to be, going to be um, uh, determined. So, so getting those, those trees under control, going moving from establishment to production is, is one of the key decisions to make and, and nutrient management is definitely part of that. And then soil applications, you know, we've talked about um, root uptake and, and, uh, and that for Honeycrisp, it's largely a distribution problem. There's lots of calcium in the leaves. There's incredibly high, high amounts of calcium in the leaves of Honeycrisp, actually higher than say Gala. I think Leveng's done some of this work where, where leaf calcium is, is very high in uh, Honeycrisp and fruit calcium is low, but Gala has uh, lower, lower leaf calcium and higher fruit calcium. So, and very often it's, it, you can do a whole lot to the soil, but it's not going to change the fruit calcium concentration because it's a distribution issue. It's a crop load issue. It's, it's, it's a vigor issue. It's something, something within the tree itself, not related to the availability of the calcium in the soil. So if you don't have a calcium deficiency in your soil and, and you don't have any problems with, with root health or uptake, um, applying calcium to, to the soil probably not isn't gonna help very much. Um, so uh, that probably, probably hopefully spurred some, some discussion and some questions and I'll, I'll leave it there.